All right, let's transition to the second uh, stage of this uh, webinar then. And so for the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, I'll give you a quick introduction to FieldView. I expect that most of you are uh, totally new to the software. So uh, there will be a brief introduction. I'll try to also give you uh, the first mandatory steps if you want to st uh, start using FieldView by yourself. Uh, so just a couple of slides to start with. I uh, just want to go briefly about uh, above the uh, history uh, of a software. So FieldView has been developed for about the same time as DevOps 360. All right, so FieldView has been developed by um, Intelligent Light, a company out of uh, New Jersey in the US. And that's still where uh, our development team is based. Uh, we joined the TechPlot family in October 2019, uh, when Fela has, um, sorry, has been acquired by Vela. And we are now transitioning to being a single company, so everyone being under uh, TechPlot Incorporated. So TechPlot really is the name of the company, and it has several products, that is TechPlot 360, TechPlot Chorus, that Jens uh, introduced to you. We also have uh, an oil and gas specific version of TechPlot called TechPlot RS, and FieldView is now under the same family of products. Uh, so they are all available from uh, the same uh, portal for customers and so on. And starting this year, uh, we are adding FieldView to the TechPlot academic suite. Uh, so uh, that makes it available to all academic customers who have an academic suite license of TechPlot. So if you're interested in giving it a shot, then uh, I'll, I'll go quickly over the basics of using FieldView. In the first part of the demonstration, uh, we'll show how quickly and easy it is to create high quality images and videos using FieldView. Uh, and then in a shorter second stage, uh, we'll work with larger data sets. Uh, FieldView has the capability to run in parallel using both MPI for parallelization and also multi-threading. And so that makes it a very efficient uh, way to look at uh, large, large, large data sets. I won't have the time today to cover the rest of uh, topics such as scripting. Obviously, FieldView has automation modes with uh, uh, script languages. We can do client server as well. If you have remote data that you want to access from a local system, uh, we can work with extracts uh, that are great to generate in batch and then visualize on a smaller system. Uh, or you can do more advanced animations than what I'm going to show you here. Uh, but obviously, uh, the rest of these capabilities you will um, will take more time to uh, to learn about and. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but uh, uh, for, for a quick start, uh, today will be sufficient for you to learn how to navigate through our interface and, and start to learn the, the tool. All right, so let's go straight to FieldView then. So this is what FieldView looks like when you open it. So it's a pretty standard uh, interface. Uh, you have some toolbars at the top and uh, you have some icons on the left for the main objects that you want to work with when doing your post-processing. So we'll start by loading the data set and go here to File, Data Input. I'll use the default direct mode that is the data is local and I'm going to read it in serial mode for the first demonstration. We have a number of uh, formats over here. So you probably recognize your solver. We have interfaces with most commercial solvers. We also have readers for uh, standard formats. So if you are developing your own code, uh, we do read CGNS, BTK, Plot3D, so large number of, uh, of formats. Here we're going to load a case into FieldView unstructured format that has been exported to by a commercial solver. So I'll go ahead and pick the file. So I have two time steps over here. Um, the grid and results are embedded into a single file, and I have one file per time step. You can see that it's uh, about 1.2 gigabyte. And so I launch the load over here. 
So Fairview has a philosophy to try to do as much things as possible initially during that read phase, which is actually more than reading. We're preparing a lot of things in the background for you for remaining operations to be faster. So here Fairview saw from the naming convention of our files that we have two time steps and it's telling me, do you want to read that as transient? And I'll just say yes. Next, the first clue that your data has been read and that you're ready to work with Fairview is that you get this outline plot, which is really a kind of a box around all of your grids. Uh, so we'll get rid of it by hitting this button over here. And the first step is typically that you want to look at your geometry. So geometries are under the boundary surfaces panel over here. Uh, hit that icon to get a panel, and you can see that everyone is done as panels per object type in Fairview. So I have one panel for boundaries, one for cut planes, one for streamlines, and so on. All panels are built in kind of the same way. So it, all, it always starts with the Create button. You can see that until I hit Create, really nothing is enabled. So I need to create a surface first. And then it populates the list of Bondi types. So that's going to look very different on every one of your cases. That's really the boundary condition names as provided by the solver. So in this case, we are working on an Excel IO simulation on an airplane. So if I want to see the plane first, I'll just type in a few letters and that filters the list. So from there, I can just select everything I have, hit OK. And if I zoom in on the plane, you can see that I'm starting with a mesh view. We are starting to see our geometry. So I changed from mesh type to smooth. Okay. And obviously, we have some missing parts. So we'll continue to um, uh, select more parts. So after the plane, I want to look at the propeller. So I select everything that has propeller in the name, except the two. Uh, cylinders uh, that are actually part of the, the mesh. We are working with a mesh uh, that has a, um, a, a sliding interface. And uh, those are the two boundary conditions for the sliding interface that I don't want to look at. All right, so this is our aircraft. So from here, we can change the coloring. We can shift to a scala base coloring. I have the list of variables over here. So what we'll do is uh, pick uh, static pressure instead, and then go from geometry coloring to Scala coloring. I have several tabs. One is for doing everything that is related to the color map. And from there, I can adjust the mean and max for my current color map. OK. Um, so you can see very quickly, uh, we are coming up with uh, uh, a nice view of our results. Let's shift back to uniform geometry coloring and we'll move on to the next type of object. So very similar to Jan's demonstration earlier, the next step is going to be to work with cut planes. So over here I've got an icon showing a coordinate surface. You can see that the panel is very similar. I find the create button in the upper left corner. So I start by hitting the Create button, and the surface is created very quickly. Uh, and in the same way, I'll change the display type, look at a scalar. For this one, we'll look at velocity magnitude in that plane. Over here, adjust the maximum. Okay. And Fieldview makes it very easy, very efficient to work with planes. I can change the direction by just hitting this button. I can change the position by working with a slider over here. Uh, and you can see that Fairview is very fast at doing that. I was talking about some optimizations that we are doing during this, the read, uh, and that's where they show up. Uh, let me simplify the view a bit. I'll use the sliders over here to reduce the extent of my plane. So let's go from, let's say, 5 to minus 5. And in the other direction, we'll do, let's do 3 by 3. OK. 
All right. Uh, and you can see as well that one of the important aspects of field views philosophy is that everything is always happening in real time. So there are very few apply buttons in field view. Anytime you touch something, you can see the changes happening in real time in the graphics window. Um, okay, so what I'll do next is let's adjust the sliders over here. Oh, wrong direction. Okay, so from here to here, we'll increase the number of steps. And I'll let field view sweep the plane location. So uh, not sure how quickly this is going through uh, with the uh, web application we're using for this webinar. But uh, if you're doing that on your system, as you see, this animation is really smooth and, and really quick. From that point, if I want to save that as a video, I just have to go to Tools, Flipbook, Build Mode, OK over here and the sweep button I had over here now became a build button. So if I hit it, Fairview is going to create the video. So it's going through all the images, uh, saving them in memory. And once done, Fairview will let me control the frame rate for my video. And I can save that to an MP4 over here. So Fairview uses uh, H.264 codec, so that video is uh, right off the bat compatible with uh, uh, YouTube, all PowerPoints on on uh, all systems. So something very portable that will not going is not going to give you any trouble when playing it at uh, conferences or in front of a classroom or whatever. All right, let's get rid of the this video mode. Um, so here I'm working with one plane. I just, just want to show you the logic in field view. If I create again, I get surface number two with all properties being inherited. And so if I change the plane position and repeat this operation several times, I can get several cuts for my plane. Okay. Uh, let's bring up a legend. So I'll just need to do a show legend. So I get it with the default settings. Uh, shift left click to move it around. Shift right click to resize it. Here we'll want to make it horizontal. I've got some room at the bottom. Then you have all the uh, settings you can think about. Um, so here I'll want eight labels, zero decimal places. Uh, you can see that by default, I'm getting the Z location for that plane. And so if I change that plane location, the Z value, uh, didn't type it in at the right spot. Sorry about that. So Z equal. And so if I change the, the plane location, the legend gets adjusted automatically. But since I want the legend to be valid for all three planes over here, I'll just get rid of it. OK, so you, now if I'm happy with this image, I can either go over here, File, Save Image. Same logic as with 360. I can either save an image for the entire graphics window when I have multiple frames. I can show you that very quickly. If I go here and I've made an instance, I have a second window. And by default here, I synchronized both. And I'm just showing copies. Uh, this could be a totally different data set if I want to compare two data sets at the same time. So from here, again, File, Save Image, is a graphics or window. And I save it to PNG by default, which is what I recommend, but you have also access to a number of image formats. Or if I want it to be faster, I can also go here, Edit, Copy, Graphics. Now let's come back to... Uh, my PowerPoint, I'll hide a new slide and just space the image right there. All right, back to field view. Uh, let's simplify the view a little bit. So if I don't want those planes anymore. I can either delete them or make them invisible. And we'll, we'll move on to a third object type, isosurfaces are very useful for investigating a 3D flow like this. 
isosurfaces are from from this icon over here on the left. So you're starting to get the logic. First, I need to create a surface. This one is a bit particular because I need to pick a variable for the isosurface first. So I'll go ahead and do that. So the vorticity magnitude will be interesting on this flow. So we'll calculate the first isosurface and then the panel will be populated. The default value at the minimum isn't giving me much over here. So what we'll do is try to find a value that works well. Let's change the shading and put some scala coloring on this surface. So that's probably a bit too much. So we'll reduce it by, let's try an order of magnitude first. Okay. Uh, so now we can see the, the wake of our propeller around the aircraft. That's interesting. The problem when looking at an isosurface of vorticity is that you're also catching a lot of the shading uh, that you have in the boundary layer. And it's hard to understand what uh, vorticity is caused by shading or what is caused by rotation in your vortices. So that's why a lot of people use either uh, Q criterion or Lambda 2 instead on these isosurfaces. And as we saw, Q hasn't been exported from this solar. That's fine. Uh, we can compute it in field view. So what we'll do is go to the function formula specification panel, where you have a number of, op of operators uh, that you can do on scalars on ve or vectors. And we have two special operators at the top over here called CFD functions. So we'll use the one for Q criterion. And all we need to do is tell field view what is the name of our velocity vector. Oops. Okay, so I'll terminate the formula. I can either use the formula as a name or provide a name for it. And now this variable is available for computing a new isosurface. So I'll go ahead and calculate. Uh, I haven't mentioned it, but I'm working with a case that is uh, 12 million nodes over here, unstructured. Uh, so you can see everything is pretty pretty quick pretty quick uh, for things like Kuketarian, we use multi-threading to use all the, the cores on your system all the threads uh, to speed up the calculation so for q what i like to do again is uh, start with a value uh, remember that for q we're looking at positive values to highlight uh, uh, vortices uh, so that's probably a bit too much. We are seeing some artifacts and the sliding mesh over here. Well, no, it's probably not enough. So we'll further increase it by an order of magnitude to filter further. And yeah, now we have a better view again of the wake around the aircraft. Um, all right, just checking how much time I have left. Okay, so let's move on to probably the fourth largest uh, uh, most widely used type of object. Uh, so I'll again clarify the view over here by turning off the visibility and we'll move on to streamlines. Same ID, I start by creating my streamline rake. So a rake is a group of streamlines. What I can do is define the locations of the seeds from which uh, streamlines are going to be computed. So I'll just use the plate tips over here to put three points and then we'll use a mode that is called add between to put a line of seats between the two so we'll do 20 here and then another 20 between number one and number two okay from that point just have to hit calculate to get streamlines i'll use scala coloring again i need to increase the range a bit 80 is probably better okay and i have several display types you can change to ribbons which are nice because uh, they show some information about vorticity along the line as well uh, or can have something more dynamic with a line of spheres i can increase the number of spheres and animate that so again i'm not sure this is going very well through the web app but i encourage you to try it for yourself. Uh, Fieldview is very fast at uh, rendering this kind of uh, animation. And in the same, same ID, you can save it quickly to an MP4 if you want to export that.
All right, so that's uh, really a, a nice video over here. Uh, what we'll do is take it one step further. Let's say that you want to really highlight your work and provide more context for people who are not very familiar with CFD. So what I'll do is go back to uh, my boundary surface over here. And yeah, let's see. Uh, so what we'll do is go back to filter out the propeller elements. I'll deselect them now. Okay, and we'll create a second boundary surface. So I hit create, in which I will put everything that is from the propeller. And now I can work separately on this surface. I can give it a different color, or better, I can give it a material property. Uh, yeah, let's shift to Chrome over here. And you can see that with some environment maps, we have a very fast rendering, although we have much higher quality on, on our surfaces. So from the materials tab over here, you can see all the materials that are available. We have a number of different metals. We have paint, which is nice for cars, especially matte paint, shiny plastic or dull plastic for which you can adjust the color as well. So what we need next is really to have more surfaces for the aircraft to show more details. So instead of um, doing it step by step, what I'll do is called back some works that I've done in preparation in Fieldview. And so I have saved this work. And what I can do is open a restart. We have restarts that are either for all of your work that will that are very similar to layout in 360. So they will load the data and apply a full session. Or we have the various properties of your session saved in individual files. So here I have one that has just a boundary surface information. So I'll load that. And it's taking me one step further. I have the, the rest of the surfaces predefined. So then I just have to double click on the surface to make it the current one. You can see here the yellow one is my current surface. And I'll change it to metal. Uh, yeah, let's do iron for it. Uh, the propellers uh, will pick titanium. And I need to make it. Material rendering, okay. Uh, over here, the canopy, we have one that works great. In glass, yeah, maybe that's a little too transparent. Okay, and for the rest of the aircraft, I'll use, yeah, a matte paint. Like, uh, the default color for it is uh, one of the paints that, uh, uh, air forces around the world used for uh, absorbing um, uh, radars. Uh, and so, yeah, from this one is probably a bit too modern as a color for this aircraft, but we can go for yeah, maybe a green over here, darker, kind of a, a camouflage green, maybe. Let's see. Yeah, a bit too yellow. Okay. All right, and so you can see that the, the rendering is just as fast, but now we have really this impression that we are working with a given material. And again, that helps people who are not too familiar with CFD to uh, you know, get more understanding of what parts they're looking at, and uh, it gives more credibility to your CFD results. Uh, a final touch on this one, we're going to have add a background. So for the background, you can either have plain colors or you can use an image. So for an aircraft, of course, of course, it's nice to put it on on the on a cloudy sky. I'll stretch it to uh, the limit of my screen, and it's nice as well to have it match the environment maps that I'm showing. So we've got clouds being reflected over here uh, that do match what we have in the background, and from that point, I can bring back all the surfaces that I was working with. I can have my eyes of surface. I can have my Streamlines, let's go back to ribbons. Um, and so I can have a technical image, but also with some some nice um, highlights of, uh, of the works that I've, that I've been doing. All right, so let's uh, stop there for this 
demonstration of the, the main capabilities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the quick second step in my demonstration, what I want to do is show you uh, how FieldView can be very efficient with large data sets. So I'll take a couple of minutes to show you that uh, before we, uh, we transition to the Q&A. Um, all right, so let's start our session fresh. So I'll just restart FieldView. And this time around, I'm going to use uh, parallel to load uh, a very large case. So we'll go over here. So the only thing I want to change is pick option local license parallel. Uh, all licenses of FieldView, all floating licenses comes with the ability to launch up to eight MPI processes. Um, in my case, I have uh, uh, 16 cores actually with uh, the license to use all of these cores. So I'm getting additional speed ups from that. We'll go file data input. Uh, and this time around, I'll load the Plot3D case. This is a multi-grid, structured multi-grid format. And it will also turn on the new capabilities that we've introduced in the last version of Fairview. We call it auto partition. That will create new partitions if I have grids in my data that are larger than the rest. And that also that will make it easier for Fairview to do load balancing between the processes. So Fairview does that automatically. You just have to turn it on. Um, I'll go and pick my case over here. Uh, you can see that I have 22 grids over here. Initially, the case had only 17, uh, but five blocks were larger than the rest. And I've been uh, further um, uh, further split. So this case is 400 million cells. And you can see that thanks to parallel, yeah, sure. I showed you that. Yeah, over here you can see all of my cores have been working for a few seconds. So feel you did that automatically. Uh, and yeah, we'll probably see that if I move it to the side. And now I'm going to read the results. This is a split grids and result format. So reading my results. Yeah, you can see all cores going to 100% and feel is done loading the results. So same ID here, I'll start by removing the outline, bring up the boundary surface panel, create a surface. So here, this is a simpler data set from the geometry point of view. Uh, it's just one wing uh, on which we have a, a very fine uh, resolution and, and, and very, good, uh, very good representation, modelization of the, of the turbulence. Uh, so let me just yeah, show you the mesh on it, just to give you a feeling for how refined the mesh is on this case. You can see that Fairview has no problem working with it. Uh, I'll make a cut plane over here in the Z direction, bring it close to the profile. Yeah, I will show you again how fine this mesh is. And if I look at the results over here, and see color map. Yeah, and so you can see that thanks to parallel over here, FieldView is able to read that case very, very quickly and do all of these operations faster than it would uh, working in serial. Or so for uh, whenever you have large cases with multiple grids, uh, feel you will have the ability to read that in parallel and you will gain the significant time in, in your operations after that. Um, all right, I think I'll, I want to uh, stop there so that we keep in us uh, time for uh, the Q&A section. Uh, so I'll stop sharing and get back to you, uh, Vivek, if you have any questions that you want to uh, know away at this stage.